Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I'm really glad that you're all here. So I would like to give you a few tips how you can ask questions after the presentation to uh, our speaker. So at the bottom of your screens, you probably see this is a, a, a tab which is called Q&A, which you can open and then you can post all the questions you have for the speaker. He will answer all the questions after, all his, after his presentation. So be, please be patient. We're definitely going to address all your questions at the end. So now I'd like to pass the word to our speaker who's presented today, Alvin Beckins. He's the managing director for automotive line and business of Microsoft. And uh, he will be presenting today about automotive in mobility revolution. Alvin, over to you. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Alvin uh, and we'll be talking a little bit with you today about the mobility revolution. Thanks all for joining the webinar. So, um, what I thought we would uh, talk about today is first I'd like to give a very brief introduction about myself and um, after that um, actually talk about the mobility revolution, um, what we as Luxoft do to contribute, and then also how you can contribute, uh, followed by the Q&A session. So first of all, about me, um, I'm, as introduced, I'm the head of uh, automotive at Luxoft. Um, I have um, been at Luxo for about a year. Uh, before that, I was the CEO of a company working in, in the automotive industry as well uh, that was acquired by Luxoft uh, and also worked for companies like Volvo Cars and, and Netscape uh, prior. So always working with software and automotive, um, well, at least for the past 20, 20 odd years. So, before we, we can talk about what the mobility revolution is, I'd like to share a couple of images that actually um, kind of give a very good impression on why it's going to happen. Uh, this particular picture is, you know, you can choose any of these from any kind of brochure from, a, from, from any kind of car. Uh, this is the dream, basically, right? This is how we all would like to uh, drive on a long winding road all alone in beautiful nature. Uh, reality for most of us when we drive is more like this. We um, actually sit in a traffic jam. It's still, however, quite a stylish picture. Um, if we're really, really honest to ourselves, many of us spend quite a lot of time in environments like this, in a car. And in many locations, it's even worse because you actually see situations like this. You see lots of smog, lots of congestion. It's inconvenient to drive uh, with your car uh, to different locations nowadays. And, um, sorry, I'm just clicking away the chat window. And this is something where, where public opinion is really turning against the usage of automobiles in city centers, et cetera. Um, really, it's not really sustainable anymore for, for the industry as a whole. So if we take a slightly different approach, um, let's look at a, a regular street um, somewhere. Uh, this is a picture that you can actually see on a nice day in any city, you see uh, lots of cars being parked uh, and a car driving. Uh, and oddly enough, this is actually what the industry looks like today. Uh, a car is typically only in use about 4% of the time and collects, well, dust, to be honest, 96% of the time, uh, which of course has a tremendous effect on public space. What the same street could look like in about 15 to 25 years from now is more like this, uh, a car with you know, a street with vehicles on it, but the vehicles are only there when used because vehicles can actually, if, if cars are autonomous, um, be used maybe 96% of the time instead of 4% of the time. So you could have many fewer vehicles actually in your public space, in, in the public streets, um, and create a better, um, better utilization of the vehicle, but also a better living environment for, for people. To illustrate that, you could look at what a city of like Houston could look like in the same time frame, so 15 to 25 years from now, uh, an aerial picture of Houston slightly modified because this is what the city actually looks like today. And all the blue spots are occupied with basically parking spaces for, for cars. So you can imagine, if you go back again, you can imagine how much the, the quality of life for us as the people, the inhabitants of these cities can improve. And there's a lot of innovation going on when it comes to transportation, not, not just in the automotive industry, there is also, for example, uh, companies like, like this, like Hyperloop, who are 
working hard to revolutionize transportation in um, slightly longer uh, distances, so more like continental travel, um, such as, for example, um, a solution that they propose for, for Germany. And you can see that you know, the distances in Germany are quite significant. It will literally take you to drive from Hamburg to, to Munich. It will take you anywhere between, I don't know, six, eight hours, and with traffic, maybe 12 if you're unlucky. And what you can see here is that you can actually loop around all of Germany in a hyperloop in about a little over two hours and basically go from Hamburg to Munich in under an hour, if that would be a direct stretch. So there's a lot of really interesting things that are happening in, in the area of transportation. And of course, they all affect the automotive industry. So if we look at uh, the, the main trends in the automotive industry, there's a number of really important ones that we'd like to, to just walk through. The first one, of course, is electrification. Electrification is something which started with you know, very high-end premium vehicles, um, such as Tesla, who successfully introduced fully electric cars. But many, many car companies are introducing electrification in a higher and higher degree. Um, countries like Norway have uh, already proclaim that as of 2025, a car must be at least a hybrid to be sold in Norway as a new vehicle. Uh, the UK is following suit. Uh, and also certain car companies like Volvo have said that we will not sell uh, cars without electrification going forward. Now, building electric cars is uh, a fundamental redesign of the actual vehicle and also the underlying vehicle architectures. Um, and that creates a big change in the industry and it has a big, imp big impact on, on the automotive industry, the automotive manufacturers, but also their entire supply chain. Another thing which is happening, of course, and, and this is something we all talk a lot about, is autonomy. Now, autonomy will come gradually in multiple stages. First, you know, assistance systems where you still need to be attentive, but the ultimate goal is to develop level five autonomous vehicles that are basically robotic vehicles that don't need any kind of supervision in order to transport people safely from A to B. The engineering challenges that the, that the industry is facing with autonomy is, of course, on the one hand, the investment to actually make autonomy a reality, to make autonomously driving cars safe, reliable. Um, that's a, a tremendous investment, not just in, in terms of computer vision and, and, and in AI and decision-making systems, but also, again, the entire architecture in the vehicle uh, next to that. But um, also, um, the time we gain by transporting ourselves in autonomous vehicles is, is huge. Uh, there's a study by McKinsey that says that if all of the vehicles that we have on Earth today would drive autonomously, then we as humanity would collectively save more than twice the amount of time it took the Egyptians to build the pyramids at Giza every day. And that time, we would most likely want to use for something else than, than what we currently do, and that is actually pay attention to driving. Um, and that changes dramatically the user experience that you would expect inside a vehicle. So there's a lot of new requirements uh, to the automotive industry, um, which again is, is both the car makers and their entire supply chain related to autonomy. Another big trend which I think we can see happening in society overall, the sharing economy um, is also something that, that we believe will happen in the automotive industry. Um, when consumers transition from private ownership to shared usage of transportation, um, this will have a profound change on the car industry itself. If you think about it, a car maker today uh, builds a product based on customer research and sells that based on emotional uh, grounds in many cases. Uh, many cases practical, of course, but many cases also very emotional grounds. And if you use a service, um, like a transportation service, then all of a sudden your buying behavior as a consumer will change. Your loyalty will be different. Your touch points with the car maker or the a service provider will be different. And, and this will have a profound change on how the entire industry works. Um, and of course, it will need a lot of development underneath to make it possible. Finally, uh, reverting back to the huge amount of time that people will have when driving in autonomous vehicles, there is the concept of the, the personal digital lifestyle. 
Now, we see more and more that in the past, uh, the industry provided new user experiences in the vehicle to, to you know, entertain with uh, media players and also video players, recent entertainment systems, etc. But we see the ecosystems that, that we as humans, as, as, as people uh, adhere to, are becoming more and more personal. You know, for example, I have you know, an ecosystem that follows along with my phone and I've spread that throughout my house. Uh, and it's, it's what I use. I use certain services, I use certain types of devices, and I want to bring them with me. So not necessarily the device, but my lifestyle. Uh, for example, how I consume music. I consume music in one way, and I'm not really interested in consuming it in any other way, using a different service just because I happen to be in a vehicle. And, and that consumer behavior drives the need to make sure that all vehicles become very smart, natu natural extensions of our own personal digital lifestyles which is a bit of a paradigm shift in, in, in how we develop uh, in-vehicle entertainment systems today. So all of these big trends are what we um, at Luxop call the mobility revolution, um, a future where we believe there will be zero emissions, zero accidents, and zero ownership, actually, uh, which, of course, create a very, very interesting landscape for our industry. Now, if we look at that and take that back into you know, a picture of how some car makers see their future, what is it then actually we will be able to contribute? And how do we contribute? Well, we as Luxoft contribute by providing smart technology enabling the mobility revolution. That's really what we strive to do. In order to understand that a little bit better, we want to go back and look at the car industry. Um, there's a fantastic quote that comes from a guy called uh, Horace Rackham, who uh, said, and of course these exist in every industry, right? Who said, the horse is here to stay. The automobile is only a novelty, it's a fad. Uh, Horace was the president of the bank who was advising Henry Ford's lawyer um, not, to, not to invest in the Ford Motor Company because of course, you know, Ford Motor Company is, is never going to be anything. Um, instead, the car industry has developed into an industry which has been extremely successful at developing high quality, reliable, mechanical products that actually work really well uh, in, you know, in, in, in the society that we, we had. Uh, they are experts at building architectures that combine many different components from a huge amount of sub-suppliers, uh, supply chains where the logistics change to, from sub-suppliers all over the world to factories with maybe two days of stock and still build uh, you know, complete vehicles uh, without any major interruptions, um, the industry has done fantastic things. But in the new world, in the mobility revolution, there's a couple of new challenges to the industry. It's not enough anymore to develop the best cars. Car makers actually have to become really good software companies. Car maker suppliers have to become really good software companies. And this is something that they haven't traditionally been. So this is a big challenge. Um, not only that, they have to become connected service providers. Uh, you see this already happening with many car companies who are launching the first attempts to actually not sell vehicles, but lease them or have subscription models and other kinds of things. But there are some fundamental changes related to that. So like I said before, today, a car maker um, will actually communicate with you through a brochure and advertising uh, to entice you to buy a product. Uh, you will actually go to a dealership and evaluate their product, but many of the dealership are not even theirs. So the touch points, the customer relationship that they have is not as direct as, as we would think. And if you're lucky and you buy a product which is high quality, then for the next two or three years, you will actually not have a lot to do with the company that just sold you the vehicle because it will just work. Right? service in the next, well, every second year or something like that. And going from there with, you know, certain type of loyalty and brand loyalty, and, you know, I'm, I'm used to using a certain type of product, etc. cetera, um, going to become a connected service provider, like, well, let's make the example Uber, means that your touch points, your customer relationship changes dramatically. It means that you will have to change your business model. Uh, you all of a sudden become a fleet owner, not just from a financing perspective, but you actually own the fleet and you sell it based on the service uh, instead of selling a product based on 
you know, an emotional uh, attraction to a product, for example. So the industry as such needs to have a completely different view, for example, on the consumer uh, and the, the level of customer insight that they will need to have will grow. And that drives massive amounts of data analytics requirements, et cetera, which the car industry hasn't had that much before. So in short, the mobility revolution represents fundamental change for the car industry. And what we as Luxup try to do is our mission is to co-create smart solutions that empower our clients to actually make that transition to sustainable mobility. Now, what that means is that in, in the three technical domains where we're active, we strive to help our clients to build the platforms of tomorrow and also deploy them in actual products. Um, we currently work in three domains. The first domain we call digital cockpit or digital user experience, uh, where we strive to put stunning user experiences on the road from pixel to silicon. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means in a bit. The second domain, which we call under the hood, is where we put safe autonomous driving on the road from, from algorithm development to network vehicle platforms. And in the extended vehicle domain, we actually look beyond the car. So we work very extensively to expand automotive to automobility. We work on the service side, we work on the cloud side, we work on bringing innovative technologies, like for example, Alexa, into vehicle platforms. A little bit more about what we do in digital cockpit. Um, for example, we do a lot of user experience development. For us, user experience is not just HMI. Um, it is actually the entire chain from pixel to silicon. It's how you design a fantastic user experience, which is easy to use, visually attractive, or you know, attractive in the sense of the natural speech dialogue, but something that, that really invites you to interact with a product, um, but also all the way down to how it's implemented. And again, not just the HMI implementation, but the entire systems underneath, the middleware, the basic platforms, how we make sure that these platforms function really well on certain types of hardware, how they integrate to the vehicle, et cetera. So we start with the user experience, the design part. Uh, and that's why we have a, a big design team which develops really fantastic uh, design concepts uh, for our clients and our, and our own in-house concepts and build everything underneath. Um, some examples of, of some work that we've done, you see on the pictures here. Uh, we also do a lot of work in the digital cockpit domain in, in the concept stage. So we work, and this is why we say co-create, we work with many car makers and tier one suppliers on development of concepts to evaluate what the products of tomorrow can look like. We do this from a design perspective, but also from an implementation perspective, uh, which is really, really both interesting work and it's very valuable for us and the clients to understand how far we can push the boundaries of technology right now for the next uh, product generation. But of course, we also do a lot of production work. So we do production design work, production implementation work for, for many tier one suppliers and many car makers. And in order for ourselves to understand where tomorrow might be, we do very advanced um, design and research on uh, new interaction concepts. So here, for example, you see a concept that we're developing uh, actually currently uh, where we look at um, uh, augmented reality-based user interfaces. Sorry about that. Now, uh, when it comes to the under the hood domain, we do uh, anything from software development and architectures bringing sensors to motion. Now, this is a very complex domain. It's not so visual um, as, as the as the, uh, the digital cockpit domain, um, but it has a lot of really interesting engineering challenges. Now, as we mentioned before, as the industry moves to autonomy, um, there is a, a vast change in electric architectures. Uh, a typical car today might have anywhere between 40, 60 to 80 to 90 um, computers, uh, networked computers to, to actually drive the various functions from the wipers on your screen to your, your, your navigation system to, you know, et cetera. And uh, when cars become autonomous, um, you actually need a lot of power, of course, to actually process all this sensor data, make the right decisions, but also 
control all the actuators in the vehicle so that the vehicle behaves like you want to. And this drives a redesign of, of multiple parts of the architecture where the amount of components is, is decreasing dramatically, but the power in these components is increasing dramatically. So there's really high performance components that are being developed, still networked, that require a very solid architecture to be able to uh, ensure that all network communication is of course timely and, 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 and safely and securely. A graphical picture on this is if you, if you look, for example, here, what we do is we work with um, um, designing basic networks, so service-oriented architectures that can be extended also into the cloud. Um, with um, Ethernet networks, we do a lot of work on Ethernet network, network design, uh, and also how to partition many more features in these big domain controllers, these highly powerful domain controllers. Another thing we do is we support the industry both through uh, working with third-party products um, that build these high-performance clusters, which are basically you know, highly powerful pieces of hardware with hypervisor technology and multiple operating environments on top of them in order to be able to combine safety-critical and computational-heavy uh, features. And um, based on these architectures, we also do a lot of application and algorithm development. So for example, we do deep learning related work on object detection for, for, for customers um, and also just logic implementations and deployment of, um, for example, front camera systems uh, or other systems in, in, in vehicles. When it comes to connectivity, we again do uh, quite an extensive um, amount of services and very important in the new world for, for our clients is when all their products become networked and usage and ownership models change, um, they have to be able to be very confident and prove that all of their systems are secure. So cybersecurity and cyber safety are, are very focused areas of ours where we have um, a consulting practice that supports multiple clients on actually auditing and designing their systems for, for security and safety, which is super important. Uh, also related to that is that we do a lot of system testing uh, related to um, these systems that are being developed. And of course, we provide the solutions to enable connectivity, such as um, building a telematics diagnostic solutions, um, uh, over-the-air update solutions, and also bring uh, non-traditional automotive solutions into the backend systems, such as cloud migrations, leveraging modern technologies for doing IT infrastructure development based on, for example, Amazon Cloud or, or Azure, uh, and doing a lot of data analytics. Diagnostics is an extremely important area for us in connected mobility. Um, again, if you think back to what is happening in the industry where the car currently is is not used on a service. A service is basically a source of revenue for the industry. But once you become a big fleet owner and sell your products on, um, on, on um, you know, a usage-based fee, then guaranteeing the uptime of your vehicle, just like it is currently in the, in the commercial vehicle industry with trucks, becomes extremely important. And that's why diagnostics, remote diagnostics, remote repair, remote software update, predictive maintenance are so important. Similarly, when these new vehicle architectures arise and you see the requirements of what is happening outside of the vehicles, uh, we see a big trend in the definition of actual service-oriented architectures where the boundaries between what's in the vehicle and what's outside the vehicle changes. And, and this impacts uh, dramatically, again, the, the entire architecture of all our infrastructure around uh, both in and outside the vehicles where we're helping our clients design and implement these for next generation vehicles. Um, one example, uh, for example, what we've done is uh, fleet monitoring applications, which uh, are slightly smaller scale than, than what I think the industry will see going forwards, but basically do the similar, similar types of things where we analyze data, we collect data, and we apply you know, big data related to technology and AI to understand where we can expect uh, problems and predictably maintain them to the extent that we increase the uptime of the actual uh, fleet. Now, 
that's what, what we do in the mobility revolution. Um, let's talk a little bit about who we are and, and what uh, you could do in the mobility revolution. So Luxoft is in a very fortunate position to be an independent company. We are publicly listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We are not owned or controlled by uh, you know, a, a player in the industry that, that prohibits us from working with other players, which means we can work with all the car makers, all the tier one suppliers, all the technology vendors, and especially also all of the interesting developments and innovation that are happening outside the automotive industry, which are going to find their way into the automotive industry. Um, we are together about 2,000, uh, well, we are more than 2,000, we grow very rapidly, but um, we are, let's say we're 2,000 plus employees right now inside of Luxoft Automotive. Luxoft as a company is about 13, 14,000 employees. Um, more than 32 active clients, we are very healthy financially, and we've been around uh, in automotive as a separate entity within Luxoft for about 12 years. Now, you can see some of our locations. We are geographically, uh, we are a global company. We have offices in, in Asia. We have offices in uh, the US. We have multiple offices also in, uh, in Europe, of course. And um, what we are currently doing is we are actively recruiting and hope to grow our team uh, with you as well, uh, those of you who, who chose to listen today, in cities such as Berlin, Bucharest, Munich, Gothenburg, Kiev, Odessa, Krakow, but also Seattle, Detroit, etc. It's a very long list um, because we're growing very fast uh, and we really hope to welcome uh, as much talent as we possibly can uh, to our team. For example, uh, we recently opened uh, an office in Berlin where we are currently starting in, uh, in offices by Mindspace, uh, Curiosa. Mindspace is a, a very nice office hotel, which is a great place to work, great place to start. Um, it's also the, the offices where, where Apple chose to, to establish themselves in Berlin. Uh, and also we are doing this together with one of our, our, our biggest uh, clients in the automotive industry. So, what I would hope that you do, uh, of course, ask lots of questions. Um, the Q&A is going to open very soon. Uh, and um, look at the career opportunities that we have open right now. Uh, so please get in and help us empower the mobility revolution at career.luxop.com slash automotive, where all of our openings are listed. And if you have any questions, then also, you know, of course, feel free to drop me an email at uh, well, A-B-A-K-K-E-N-E-S at Luxoft.com. So with that, let's uh, open the Q&A. So let me see. Um, I have lots of questions here. Now I need to, the questions are pouring in, so I can't actually focus my screen right now. I'll, I'll go from the top. Um, let me read this. What happens? So the first question is, what happened in the regulations government, government authorities? Are there any support for autonomy electrification uh, except of the US? That's a very good question. Um, there's always two things. There is technological development. How fast does something go and how fast can we deploy something in the market? And then there is market acceptance. And then, of course, there's regulatory aspects. So currently, there's a, com a, a number of countries where it's actually regulatory wise not possible to drive fully autonomous cars, actually many of them. Uh, but there are already a number of regions where legislation is, is permitting for fully autonomous driving, such as, for example, the state of Arizona and the US. Um, full autonomy, so level five autonomy, is most likely uh, still uh, you know, quite a, a bit of years away, uh, not only because of technology, but also because of regulatory uh, aspects. Um, second question, how about sharing versus personal usage? I personally spot situations when car sharing services are very specific for specific uses, but not for the mass market. For example, people will still try to hide in the traffic jams rather than use public, even comfortable transport. Um, this is a very, very good question. And um, I'll give you a very personal answer to that. Um, I think that um, I think that sharing versus personal usage is something that the older generation 
does not really grasp and understand. I think the younger generation is much more attuned to it. So the sharing economy, Airbnb, and all these kind of things, they are quite well, um, they're quite well accepted by the younger generation, not as much as by the older generation. But what will happen, in my opinion, is if you look at congestion in many cities, all over Europe, all over Asia, and also the US uh, or the Americas, you see that personal transportation is simply not working anymore. So it takes longer to get to work in a car than it does riding a bike in some cases. And that is valid even, even for me, who live in, uh, I live in, in Gothenburg in Sweden, which is not very congested at all, if you compare that to any other, uh, any other location that we just mentioned, but still, I, I myself, you know, captured myself thinking, I left my, my daughter at daycare and I saw this person that is passing me right now in the city on her electric bike uh, leave her daughter at the same time. So this, is, this doesn't make any sense. And, and these things, they will, they will start to become more apparent. And as soon as car sharing services are more convenient to use and provided that they're safe to use, uh, autonomous vehicles are safe to use, uh, I think we'll see a dramatic shift uh, all of a sudden. So there's always this tipping point that when we reach it, it will happen. Um, I compared a little bit to, for example, um, the way I, I consume music. So a long time ago, I was, of course, extremely proud and, and happy with my CD collection. I treasured it. I was very careful with it. I knew exactly what label, um, what label issued what music, etc. But today, that's not the way it is anymore. I started to use sharing services or you know, online services such as Spotify and others. And, and, and when they became good enough, fast enough, I switched like this and there's no going back. Uh, it's the same, I think, with taxi versus Uber. When Uber provided a better service, people sh shifted like this. And as long as they stay on top, they can do that. And I think the same will happen with the concept of sharing versus personal ownership. Uh, another question, uh, technological question. Uh, what sensors are you using in under the hood? And what state-of-the-art technologies are you using? Good question. Um, hi, Am. We, we provide, we are an independent software vendor. So we provide software and services. We are not a hardware company. What we do is we help the companies that build the hardware, who are part of the supply chain in automotive, to actually deploy their product well integrated into a vehicle. So for example, we are talking about state-of-the-art LiDAR uh, LiDAR sensors, radar sensors, optical sensors, um, and combine the data. We help analyze the data, we combine the data, and we're part of the process where we you know, do the calculations to actually dis make decisions based on that data. Um, if you look at the, the centralized computers, we're working with the state-of-the-art uh, SOCs, state-of-the-art FPGAs, and of course, we work a lot with the leading companies in the industry who, you know, uh, companies like, for example, um, uh, Mobileye, who provide specific purpose-built silicon to do, you know, a lot of an analytics and, and sensor fusion data uh, analytics. So that's what we're using. Uh, we work on uh, Autosar platforms, Autosar adaptive platforms, Linux platforms, um, yeah, and basically are participating in standardization committees uh, or organizations such as Autosar to work on Autosar Adaptive, such as Genevi to work on Linux, such as the Linux Foundation to also support uh, the further development and proliferation of Linux into the real-time domain, et cetera, et cetera. So that we, we do quite a lot of different things there. Next question from Artem. Um, if cars will become electro-powered, with what energy source will we replace petrol or diesel with? Um, very good question. I would not pretend to say that I'm, I'm the expert in doing that, uh, in answering that, but um, preferably, of course, we will uh, use uh, renewable energy sources. Um, again, some of us are, are in very fortunate positions, such as, for example, myself, I live in Sweden, where we have a tremendous amount of hydropower, uh, which means that more than half of the electric energy generated in Sweden comes from hydropower in the north of Sweden, where during, uh, during uh, summer and, and fall, uh, there's a lot of water amassed in, in you know, highly uh, placed regions and uh, hydro plants, uh, dams, basically, 
uh, generate half of, of Sweden's energy. So it's, it's not too hard to get access to clean energy to fuel um, electric powered cars. There's a lot of studies that have been done and arguments back and forth in Sweden and globally about whether or not there's enough electric power available to, to fuel all electric vehicles. Um, but then again, there's a lot of new developments with uh, you know, the efficiency and price points for produced energy out of, for example, solar energy um, looking very, very positive to be able to actually grow the amount of energy produced in a sustainable way. Hope that answers the question. Um, another question, is it possible to receive, receive the presentation materials? I think that the entire presentation will be on the webcast. Um, so that should be, uh, should be there. Um, next question, what roles you currently demanded and what locations? Thanks. Uh, Eugene, we are currently looking for uh, software developers that um, work in, in all domains. So we're growing in all our domains. We're looking for embedded C developers, C++ developers. If you happen to be proficient in Qt or Altasar, that's super great. Uh, we're looking for architects, uh, product owners, functional owners, people that uh, thrive for modern software development processes. Uh, because there's a lot of, you know, for us, there's a lot of uh, coaching involved in actually helping non-software development companies behave so that we can do efficient software development. So scrum masters, uh, product owners, I mentioned already, etc. Uh, but please look at uh, the career site and, and you'll see that everything there. If you have um, an interest of joining our company and you cannot see a specific position that fits, apply anyway, do a blank application and we'll make sure that it's uh, uh, well handled internally. Um, another question from Sergey. Sergey asks if we will indeed switch to autonomous driving. It's hard to believe that people will make this switch, at least not in a major way. Um, of course, a very good question. Oops. Just click there, a very good question. Um, there is multiple uh, opinions. There are people that say that autonomous, fully autonomous driving vehicles will not happen, so robocars will not happen because of regulatory aspects. Uh, other people say it will definitely happen and the industry will follow. Um, personally, I think it will happen because it, it has to happen. If I look at mobility today, um, I recently flew to, um, uh, to, to Paris and uh, had to go from Paris to an office location on the other side of Paris. It was 60 kilometers. It took me two and a half hours. Uh, there was smog. It was congested. I felt bad. I didn't, you know, I got headaches and, and it just simply doesn't work. So the way we currently transport ourselves and the effect that it has on our environment and our daily lives is, is, is in my opinion, not really sustainable, especially given the fact that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, so um, I think autonomous driving will happen. I think it will, people will make the switch, but they will make the switch not because regulatory powers tell them to, they will do it when the alternatives will basically be better, more convenient than, um, than the current way of transporting ourselves. And that I believe is why there's such a tremendous investment in this industry right now with so many companies building innovation, building new product, uh, which is really quite exciting for us because it's a great time to be in this industry. Um, a question from uh, Vislav. Um, how do you see our role in the future? Are we planning to go just beyond subcontracting? Uh, very good question. Um, our objective is to support uh, the various players in the automotive industry to succeed in making the mobility revolution a reality. Um, we are not um, developing the ambition to become a car company or to replace uh, or compete directly with our, 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 our current customers. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are not gonna change the way that we engage with our clients. We are already seeing this in many, in many client cases. We are truly helping them build uh, the capability to become software houses to build uh, their backend infrastructure, not just from an outsourcing or a subcontracting perspective, but actually helping them lead the definition of what is it we should be doing, how should we do it, and then also do it. 
So uh, for example, we're, we're building a software house uh, in Berlin together with one of our uh, major clients where we build a very transparent joint uh, entity to develop next generation software or next generation vehicles. Um, so the questions are, there's a lot of questions coming in here now. So I think I need to look at time and actually see um, which ones to answer here. Let me start here. Um, Mitsun asked, Alvin, do you think that road infrastructure is ready for AD? This varies a lot by location. And this, I think, is, is, is a big challenge. Fully autonomous vehicles that drive fully autonomously. You know, if you're talking about a well-planned, well-marked well uh, highway, it's not, technically speaking, that hard anymore. So there's a lot of technology out there that can actually make that possible. If you're talking about uh, a, a very badly maintained uh, remote area road with lots of traffic where basically three people drive side by side, it's like in an Italian city on um, two lanes, um, it's going to be more problematic. So there's definitely going to be an infrastructural investment as well to make sure that the road amp infrastructure is optimized for autonomous drive, I think. Um, do we still need street lights if cars are fully autonomous? I don't think that we as, as, as individuals would feel comfortable in completely black environments. I think the street lights will largely also be uh, for us. But of course, in, in, in remote areas, uh, in many countries, there aren't any street lights uh, during nighttime at all. Uh, you can see that just by looking at a map of, for example, Europe, you see Belgium is very, Belgium is very well lit. Uh, Germany is actually not. Um, Another question here uh, about empty streets. People mostly use cars in the rush hours and that's why 95% of the time cars collect dust. Does it ruin empty street promise? Uh, obviously this is a challenge um, because people use things in rush hours. The mobility revolution will most likely also provide a different way of looking at mobility in terms of when and where to be, where to work. Um, and the mobility revolution is not just about still individual transport. It can also be about autonomous group transport. It can be about autonomous vans. It can be about, for example, things like Hyperloop. So um, the empty street promise, um, I think can still be maintained for the masses. And this was another question somewhere as well, that this might be something which is good for, for the lucky few, but not for the masses. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think that autonomy will actually, um, when, when cars become fully autonomous, it will really, really um, benefit uh, the masses, which is, I think, the most important thing. So let's, um, let's take the next question. Uh, there's a question from Daryl. Hey, Daryl, I know you. Thanks for joining. Which silicon vendors do you see winning in the ADAS and infotainment space? Um, well, like I said, we work with all, all uh, companies. We work with multiple silicon vendors and I think there is always gonna be movement on, on who are the winners right now. There might be waves, but there's a lot of interesting, um, a lot of interesting silicon vendors right now, of course, uh, that have some really interesting product coming in. Uh, next question. Uh, Nikita asked, what do I think about Hyperloop and other technologies? Don't you think they will make cars obsolete? Um, I think that technologies such as Hyperloop uh, and initiatives such as Hyperloop are absolutely fantastic. Um, the future will tell how, how it will work, both technically and also from an acceptance perspective. But I think that there is transportation as such, uh, globally speaking, is a massively interesting technology uh, or, or industry right now. Um, and I think if you speculate and if you think that something like Hyperloop will succeed and will increase usage of, uh, you know, transportation, interregional transportation, uh, not using vehicles, then that actually, I don't think it will make cars obsolete. What it might do is change the, the, the set of requirements on vehicles. So for example, uh, I myself am, am contemplating or contemplating, I've decided that I'm going to have an electric vehicle as my next vehicle. That's, that's it end of discussion. Um, but because the behavioral pattern is still that sometimes you drive quite far, a fully electric vehicle 
is not necessarily feasible. Well, you can always, of course, take a Tesla, and a Tesla has multiple charge points, but a Tesla has some other impacts, such as price point, which, which uh, you know, might render it not, not available to everybody. Um, but if other fantastic alternatives that maybe have better quality than current uh, railroad infrastructure in many countries uh, appear, then maybe the usage pattern for me for a vehicle would be 100 kilometers. An electric vehicle that does 100 kilometers a day is fine. And, and in that sense, I think there would be um, a difference into what, how it would affect cars. Uh, I don't think cars will become obsolete as a, as a means of transport. Um, next question. Oops, I read the questions, then new questions pop up. So, so bear with me for a sec. Is there any project from Luxoft that would be an evolution in automotive industry? Any plan in the future, not just consultant service? Um, yes, but this is a public webinar, so I can't talk about specific projects. Sorry about that. There's a question. Um, it's, it is my understanding that you're mostly interested in C, C++ developers and QA in terms of software languages. What about the wave of languages such as Rust and Go? Great question. Um, absolutely super interesting. Again, we are not about doing what the industry has always done and doing more of it. It's a lot about changing the way that the industry develops software. Um, I know, for example, in my office here, we have a little uh, group of people where I am that are actively working on Rust and educating themselves on Rust. So um, absolutely. Um, when you see the job profiles, um, be sure to pitch in the new skills that you would actually bring to the table. That's more than welcome. Next question. Um, ooh, difficult question. Is there any plan on how to recycle the current fleet of millions and millions of vehicles in the next few years? Um, again, a little bit about, you know, outside of what I work with, but um, there is, for example, in the European Union, there's a directive that mandates car companies to um, reuse the vehicles that they've built. So literally, if you have bought a, a Volkswagen or whatever, and you live in the European Union, you can just basically, if it is basically old and scrap, you can drive it back to Volkswagen, you just leave the keys, and they are by law uh, obligated to recycle it and to reuse parts in a, uh, in a very good manner. So uh, there is regulation starting to come in place to actually force the industry to take care of its own problem, which I think is very, very good. Very interesting question. What do we think about artificial intelligence in automotive? Um, artificial intelligence and deep learning are definitely in automotive. Automotive has traditionally been extremely deterministic. So in the automotive industry, you would like to know that if I press this, this happens under every condition. And the de deterministic nature of the automotive in industry um, is actually one of the things that architecturally speaking is changing. So um, AI, and deep learning are fundamental aspects of, uh, for example, autonomous drive, but also predictive behavior on, uh, on user experience side. So what would you like to do? What could you possibly want to do now? And how can we be more attentive to actually fit you better? Uh, these technologies are definitely in the car. They are definitely also in the cloud, uh, contributing to how the car is, uh, is developed. And we do a lot of work with that. So if you have skills in that area, definitely um, apply. Um, a question from Mike. Uh, good, um, somebody in the UK. Uh, can you elaborate on, if anything, Luxoft is doing in the automotive space in the UK? Um, Luxoft does. Uh, we, of course, have an office in the UK. Uh, we also have a big financial industry uh, arm. And um, Luxoft in the UK is working with car makers and some sub suppliers in the UK uh, on developing next generation platforms. And that's unfortunately all I can say. Um, let's look um, at another question. There's a question here about India. Um, what do you think about electric automotive market in India? Um, 
I think it's very difficult for anyone to understand the automotive market in India uh, unless they've really uh, experienced India um, for a longer period in time. It's a very unique market um, as such. Um, I would not claim to be an expert. What I do believe is that countries like India, which because of uh, a much higher population density and because they experience a lot more pollution related issues, such as, for example, recently, I think it was world news with uh, the, the smog that was in Delhi, where, where you could literally, you know, not drive uh, because of the smog. Uh, I think countries like that will actually drive regulate, regulation, uh, pushing for um, alternate, well, sustainable fuel usage and reduction of air pollution faster because of necessity. And that will not hamper the industry. It will actually support the industry in terms of innovating. So I, I really uh, look forward to the developments in India. Um, let's look at another question. As a question from somebody called Michael, who said, um, will we see a consolidated demo by Luxoft for the mobility revolution during the next years? Um, well, Michael, good question. I think we should. We have previously been involved in developing demonstrators such as uh, the Rinspeed cars, where every year we did a concept car together with um, other companies in an ecosystem, which is always fantastic to work together collaboratively with other technology companies and not only push and do your own thing. Uh, and I think we should be looking at doing that more, especially there where we can actually push the boundaries to show people what is possible and feasible um, in the mobility revolution already today, technologically, uh, to help people maybe be a little bit more brave and develop a little bit more. So I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, let's see. I'm looking here. Interesting question. Uh, how many people do you estimate will use your technology in the future? Um, I need to make a mental note and try and figure out what that number is. We are currently, our technology is actually on the road in millions and millions of cars. So we have written code that is in you know, multiple product generations, in multiple brands in Asia, in Europe, in the US. Um, that would actually be a very fun number to show and something to count. Um, percentage wise, it's very hard to say, but um, I hope to increase it uh, quite dramatically actually together with all of you uh, going forwards. Mm, very good question, very hard question. Uh, how about moral dilemmas when it is connected to life or death situations? So, here, the industry needs to be very bold because this is actually not primarily a technical, a technical limitation. Technically speaking, we can implement systems that take the right choice as long as we decide what the right choice is. Uh, the big problem is what if the right choice means implying uh, or, or um, creating damage for a living being and choosing which one, for example. Uh, this is mostly a regulatory item. How do we manage this? And how can that be managed from a, a liability perspective? Um, some companies uh, have actually been very bold and gone out and publicly stated that when we produce autonomous, autonomous vehicles, we will take responsibility for them when driving autonomously. These are very, very, very important steps that companies are made, making in the industry. Uh, I know at least was one car company that has said that. But uh, regulation is going to have to decide how that can work and if that can work. A question from Marco, how about autonomous job or automotive job opportunities in Asia Pacific? Um, we have um, quite a few openings, I think right now, actually. We have offices in, in, in Asia Pacific, in, uh, in Penang, in Malaysia. We have an office in Vietnam and we, are, we also have an office, uh, two offices in China. Uh, where we're growing quite aggressively, especially next year in China, we will grow um, quite a lot. Uh, and we're currently investigating also op opening up in, uh, in Japan. Again, if you um, have an interest, apply anyway. If you see something that's slightly outside of where you're looking, um, 
one thing to add, which might be, um, which might be of interest, is that um, we as a company also support relocation programs. So for example, if you're interested in a challenge uh, in working on a specific position project that we have in Berlin or in Penang or, or in Detroit, and if you would like to experience living in that uh, region, uh, don't hesitate to apply. Uh, we can actually sponsor um, relocation uh, and, and provide you with a very interesting opportunity that way. Um, five minutes left. I think um, we might have to start wrapping up. I'll take two more questions and then um, the remaining questions, I think we have about 50 questions open. Uh, we will, of course, answer by text uh, afterwards. Um, now, through the 50, I have to find an interesting question here. There is a question from uh, Vladimir, are there autonomous driving projects in which Luxoft participates as a developer? Um, absolutely, multiple. Um, another question um, from Hayan, do you hire people from other countries? I'm Syrian living in Malaysia. My master's degree will be tackled in Visual Slam and I propose using multiple maps. Um, like I just answered, uh, Hayan, yes, we, we do hire people from multiple countries. Um, Actually, we are an equal opportunity employer. We welcome everyone. Um, I once did a study here in our office in Gothenburg uh, where we had 22 nationalities out of 50 people. Uh, myself, I'm Dutch, live in Sweden, uh, work in a multinational company. Uh, everyone is welcome. And I think we have time for one more, actually. There's a question here. Uh, on what level does Luxoft work with automotive manufacturers, directly with the top car makers such as BMW or with subcontractors such as Borges? Um, I would say that we work with all. Um, we work directly together with major car makers uh, on developing, for example, like I said, software houses as we're doing in Berlin and, and, other, uh, and other projects. We also work with the top uh, subcontractors and they are both software companies and tier one suppliers. We do a lot of work with, uh, well, uh, I think it's also in our public statements, we do a lot of work with, for example, with Harman, it's one of our, our, our best clients, and we also do um, a lot of work with technology vendors. So companies that have technology that needs to be integrated in next generation vehicles, uh, we do a lot of work with directly as well. So, with that, uh, I'd like to ask the moderators what they feel about timing. Should we take a few more questions or should we end? Alvin, if you have a chance, maybe just one more question and then we'll be wrapping up. Yeah. Um, hmm. Here, a question. Uh, Rodolfo asked, are you planning to bring any autonomous any automotive software development to your offices in Mexico? Um, a big yes. We have opened up our office in um, Guadalajara not uh, too long ago, and we have um, uh, actually multiple um, development projects for digital cockpit and also for autonomous drive applications um, run in Mexico. So Mexico is a, is a very important location for us. And maybe I can take one more question. So, so an interesting question here um, from Artem. Do we have career opportunities for research engineers in the automotive industry? So in order for us to be at the forefront of what we do, um, we can, of course, not just implement software on, on customer requirements. We do a lot of co-creation projects. That's why we say in our mission statement, we co-create smart technologies. We have research projects that we run with universities. We have in-house R&D projects. We spend uh, well, millions of dollars actually proactively in product development. We contribute to um, public projects such as the CUTE project. We have about 10 engineers working full-time on contrib contributing to the CUTE project uh, outside of customer projects. Uh, and we also have PhD students that we sponsor in, in a number of domains. So yes, absolutely, we can do that. 
Um, I saw one question in here as well, which is interesting um, from Ganesh. From my knowledge, Luxoft is mainly into financial domain. What's the percentage of people work in the automotive domain? I'm basically from India, Bangalore, and I would love to work with Luxoft because of the diversity it has. Fantastic. Uh, look forward to your application, uh, Ganesh. We are, um, the automotive line of business is one of the three major lines of business in Luxoft. Uh, we are the second largest in Luxoft, and we are the fastest growing. Uh, we just a couple of days ago released our, our Q2 results, and um, the automotive line of business from last year Q2 to this year Q2 grew uh, a whopping 70 plus percent, 76 I think the number was. Um, we are um, not uh, at all uh, in the shadow of financial. We are actually a very, very large prioritized domain of, um, of us. And um, uh, we are definitely interested in also uh, building our, our, our India sites, our India locations uh, to work in the automotive domain. So we look forward to, to meeting you there. Okay. And to the moderator, do you think we should <laughs> so guys we will definitely answer all the questions in writing mm -hmm. so we'll send to you the uh this webinar the link to it we have recorded it and you also will receive a list of answers to all the questions you have posted to us so thank you very much for your interest alvin th thanks so much for the presentation it was great and i'm sure everyone was very interested and also stay tuned uh, please sign up for our social media accounts on facebook linkedin we are going to have more of those webinars related to automotive as well one is scheduled for december we'll dive in a little bit more into digital cockpit space so please stay up for it and we'll definitely notify everyone and send you guys a notification when we'll be ready so thank you again and have a great day and enjoy thanks okay thank you for me as well thank you very much for uh, for joining <laughs>